I'm glad we have both of you because you represent two sides of the conversation that we want to have. Uh, and that inv involves basically, we want to try and talk about how do we prove the business case for sustainability, particularly in the field of agriculture, and how can we think about unlocking new mechanisms to provide finance and financial tools to the agriculture sector in Asia, such that even the smallholder farmers can become part uh, of a system that is stable and reproducible and profitable for all the parties concerned. So let's begin, if we could, with the sustainability sector. Uh, and Ivy, I'll start with you as, as the uh, head of sustainability for Mizuho. Just tell me a little bit about how you have come into this position and what it represents and how you see that interaction between the world of finance and the world of sustainability. Mm. Sure. I think I had the privilege of joining uh, the entire sustainable finance movement back in the days when sustainability is still uh, a novel idea. And I kind of witnessed, you know, how sustainability as a very niche topic and then becoming more mainstream and now financial institutions and the entire capital market is you know paying more attention taking it very seriously so uh, over the last couple of years we see that um you know the uh from the uh the financial institution the uh um the pro uh, the supply side of funding um they kind of you know taking uh, a lot of steps uh to first of all to standardize um, uh, some of the, uh, you know, the common ground uh, of, on standards and then giving a uh, more standardized definition on what is green, what is sustainability. And now we see, um, you know, a lot of demand coming from our clients, especially um, over the last two years when, you know, COVID really uh, uh, hit us very, you know, severely and uh, the entire, you know, um, uh, the entire world we realize that uh you know sustainability is not just something uh very um you know uh distant from us but in in fact you know every uh you know uh aspects of sustainability do affect us uh on our on a daily basis so uh over the last few years uh we've seen a lot of demand not just you know uh looking at green projects but especially clients in the Asia Pacific where, you know, they have kind of more uh, like a emphasis on the uh, social aspects. So we now have a lot of inquiries from our clients to see like how we can, you know, mobilize the capital market for some of the social projects on the ground, uh, of course, including agriculture, including smallholder farmer, et cetera. Yeah. So um, it's well, getting, you know, much more exciting. Than so I want to talk about how we can mobilize mm -hmm. finance within the understanding that actually mm. sustainability projects themselves can be profitable, can in fact be bankable in the traditional sense that you understand. And Deborah, your background is very much more from that traditional banking background. Uh, and whether your personal interests might have included sustainability, I think that you would agree that it's only within the very near recent past uh, that within the banking organization, within the boardrooms and the meetings that you've had in finance, that sustainability even arises uh, as a question. So just tell me how you interact now with this agenda of ESG within the bank and with dealing with outsiders uh, and their agendas on ESG. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it has risen quickly to be not just a topic of discussion in the boardroom, but an important um, existential discussion that, that uh, companies need to have around transition strategy. And so at Mizuho, we, we definitely, through our C-suite relationships and, and down to the day-to-day um, -day banking, uh, really embed this lens in, in everything that we look at and do. I mean, in, in terms of overcoming some of the, the issues that our clients have, have had and finding solutions to, to those, one of the main things that we focus on is breaking down the barriers and access to credit. And I think it's something you touched on. And, and one of the ways we do that is by directly providing credit in a format that, that would entice the large corporate to actually uh, have sustainability linked goals and objectives. And we do that in a way, um, in a format that is structured and there's usually a, a, a second party opinion provider. And there are certain milestones and, and things that, that those corporates need to achieve. 
and in uh, return, they enjoy either better uh, financing rates or, or more access to capital. So I mean, I'm and also talking about how the system operates in the sense that uh, we, we always, to a certain extent, and, and Ivy, just by a moment ago, she was talking about uh, putting this in a social context. We do tend to think about unlocking finance for smaller farmers and in areas like this as being a social or a non-profit or even a government responsibility and not so much a private sector responsibility. And, and what we're trying to get to here is think about how we can actually begin to break down that perception and that practice in a way that, that makes it viable for all the parties to get involved. So Deborah, I, I mean, in the in the context of the way that you are thinking about engaging with outside corporations, with outside institutions, with outside small businesses. Uh, you know, can you give us some examples about some of the challenges that are coming to you now uh, that address some of these issues? Yeah, I mean, there's an asymmetric amount of resources closer to the bigger size companies um, and not enough um, resources that have been uh, given out to the smaller companies. So. In, in relation to how that financing is set up that we were, we were just talking about, sustainable linked financing, there is an increased focus on ensuring that those funds of the corporates are deployed down the supply chain to the smaller and medium-sized businesses and eventually the smallholder farmers. So, so the incentives around deploying those funds and structures that are being put in place need to and continue to evolve to really focus on the entire supply chain. It doesn't work to simply say, decree that the supply chain must adapt. It, the funds actually have to have to make their way down to allow the rest of the supply chain to adapt. Um, and, and so, you know, in, in terms of the things that we're focused on and that we're structuring, it's actually helping to get capital to the large corporates that, that are focused on doing that and helping to directly provide capital to them, but also helping them to get access to additional capital. So one example that we recently put in place was uh, a Thai food company that was able to achieve a Japanese uh, rating, again, using our specific uh, Japan Edge in this case, and uh, having that company get a sustainability linked loan that attracted investors who could rely on that Japanese rating to, to provide more capital to that large company that then had made commitments down the supply chain to, to actually um, help the small and medium-sized companies within its value chain and supply chain. In a broad context, Ivy, I mean, when you are looking like activities like that and, and relationships and projects like that, just what are the guidelines that you're looking at from a Mizuho perspective of what a responsible and sustainable investment should look like? How do you apply that filter to the, to the work that, that you're doing? Right. So the capital market, um, the, uh, we have sort of guidance from the International Capital Market Association, who's, uh, you know, set up the, uh, uh, principle for green bonds, for social bonds, and also for sustainability bonds. Now we are moving, you know, uh, uh some of the, uh, our attention to the sustainability link product. So uh, I think we are very lucky to have, you know, a, a industry association such as ECMA to start, you know, to kickstart the market with uh, a set of principle and then uh, the capital market soon, you know, absorb it uh, very quickly and uh, get more uh, 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 like acceptance of uh, an uptake from the, uh, not just the financial institution, but also the investor space. So we have some sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, rules to guide us uh, through the entire you know, structuring procedures. And then um, we have kind of like a ecosystem, and and luckily the uh, Europe, uh, the EU, and the PBOC, you know, uh, because you know both of them are the uh, leading markets in terms of green finance. So they sit down and they try to come up with a common ground taxonomy, which uh, which published uh, late last uh, year. And then uh, so right now we have a lot more, uh, you know, reference to, uh, you know, uh, when we structure. 
in the, the green deals and also you know the sustainability deal so and the you know in the region uh different regulators they are also uh ramping up effort in uh giving more guidance to the uh, local companies as well we've seen ASEAN the ASEAN sustainable finance taxonomy Malaysia Singapore they are also you know working on you know setting up uh some guidelines so I think uh the market is uh, you know getting more robust and we are uh having more guidance to uh to structure deals that are you know accepted and you know to avoid greenwashing and sustainability washing all right well let's talk about deals in particular and uh, get away from the general principles into the actual work uh, that needs to be done uh, and both of you luckily enough are, are good to talk about this as you think about growing the mizuho footprint around asia from both a business and a sustainability perspective. Uh, tell me where you see the opportunities within ASEAN and the Asian region for unlocking finance for sustainable purposes. Uh, Deborah, why don't you start? Yeah, I mean, there's still a significant number of issuers in ASEAN who haven't yet issued any new debt in a sustainability-linked format. And actually, Ivy and I were lucky enough to co-host an event specifically aimed at those issuers with the Singapore Stock Exchange a few weeks back, and it was very, very well attended. We we actually went on for two hours with intensive Q and A, and a lot of the questions we got were about: I'm a first time issuer. I have multiple sectors, including the agricultural sector. How should I set up my green financing framework? So things that um, were really kind of basic questions around sustainability linked financing. That's a, a, a illustrative examples of what were the specific issues that most cropping up most often amongst the, the, this crowd and what they were trying to solve? What, one of the most interesting things was around um, finding a, a independent opinion provider and then the ongoing cost of, of proving that the sustainability linked goals were being met and kind of the mechanics around that, really operational detailed questions. Um, and it was fantastic because we actually had a third party opinion provider, pro provider on um, who could give real life examples. Uh, and, and it was a very, very deep um, questions on uh, particularly water usage in the hospitality sector and, and things that um, that obviously the issuers are really grappling with. We also had questions on unsolicited sustainability uh, ratings that that are sometimes assigned by different um, stakeholders and, and you know how, how to manage that proactively and how provide actually doing some initial issuance is is a way to kind of preempt and establish a, a green curve and also a way of presenting an issuer's sort of presence and and the vision from the point of view of the issuer as opposed to responding to another party um, who might be rating without an interaction. So, so there's, there were quite a lot of questions like that. Some additional questions were on the conglomerates because in Southeast Asia, there are quite a number of multi-industry uh, conglomerates that want to know, should they set up the framework at the top level or should they do it by individual sector? Um, so it's so really quite detailed questions. And it was obvious that these issuers were looking around the rest of the world, looking at Europe where this has been maybe a more developed financing framework for, for, for a longer period of time and feeling a little bit that, that there's a need to, to play catch up, which which was a great opportunity for us and the SGX. And obviously Singapore um, does help issuers who are looking to use um, the SGX and Singapore as a venue uh, through various programs and, and helps to um, kind of take away some of the costs associated with this. And, and uh, Singapore is really looking to establish itself as a green financing center and has done a lot towards that. So it was great to be co-hosting it with SGX, a natural partner in this as well. Ivy, you know, obviously that there is a thirst for information now, uh, a need for people to become more informed very rapidly. There's also, though, a, a bit of confusion, isn't there? Because there is actually a lot of information out there but sometimes it's competing, sometimes it's confusing, sometimes it's just too complicated and detailed for people to be able to absorb. Um, what for you are, are the issues that need to be addressed in order to begin to uh, unlock some of the problems that these people were facing? I think I, I just want to add a point on top of what 
Deborah just mentioned, like uh, when we talk about green finance, sustainable finance, uh, it's actually a multi-stakeholder collaboration. Uh, you know, uh, to to ensure the in integrity of the market development. So I I think uh, of course, like over the last couple of years, we've seen, uh, as you just mentioned, there are loads of information and uh clients or you know companies are still you know when it comes to uh you know, green definition they sometimes feel a little bit confused of you know which uh standard to uh, align with and also you know the technicality uh you know how why why is it like uh uh for example like the natural gas is is a, a you know a very debated topic and and you know in some region uh is acceptable but in in you that's def uh, definitely no goal so you know clients do have this kind of uh question about you know uh uh you know the uh it seems like there's a spectrum of greenness uh and and uh, as a financial institution as a financial advisor we are here to explain and you know and uh help our uh clients to uh, you know, to, uh, trying to reach uh, the the you know the the uh, the stand the, the better standard uh, and the best practices in the market as possible. I'm glad you mentioned collaboration because that really is emerging as one of the key core component elements of making progress on this front. If you it's from so many perspectives, people talk about the need to be able to reach outside of your own organization. So so Deborah, tell me how. Uh, is Mizuho as an organization responding to that challenge, particularly of forming new collaborative networks? And also the challenges that those clients that you were talking about were putting in front of you and saying, how can you help us get over this? Yeah, a, a lot of our time is actually focused on breaking down the barriers to financing access, but it's also focused on connecting the dots. And those dots are, for us, a lot of those dots exist with high tech companies in, in Japan who may be leading in, in agri-tech and, and clients in Southeast Asia who are, who are struggling and looking for potentially the, the next, next technological advantage that's going to give them uh, a heads up both in, in terms of sustainability and in terms of um, productivity and efficiency. So we host um, a lot of agri-tech Japan focused matching exercises where we're, we're connecting clients of ours with opportunities. Um, and, and that's actually been extremely fruitful and helpful for our clients in order to find ways to grow, but, but also for um, our bankers who are, who are then involved in those collaboration exercises and that sort of creativity. Um, we also see a real need to co-invest and to invest directly in, in social um, financial enablement and access to, to, to financial services for the underbanked. And actually, Mizuho has invested in two such uh, opportunities. One is uh, a Filipino digital bank, and, and the second is a digital wallet in, in Vietnam. Um, and actually, our round of investment is specifically um, going, we understand, to, to rural development and, and talking about the impact of COVID on some of the agricultural sector, clearly farmers, quite often the smaller farmers don't have access to banking services and are either unbanked or underbanked. And through Momo, our investment in uh, the, the Vietnamese wallet platform, we're actually helping uh, that company is actually helping to provide financial services to, to, to unbanked uh, rural populations. So, so there's there's the collaboration, but then there's also the direct co-investment that we see as necessary. I mean, this whole collaboration conversation brings us back to the point you made earlier on about uh, the, the, the supply chain. You know, in this world in which so much of the sustainability conversation does depend upon everybody in that chain being able to fulfill their agenda, uh, when the scope three emissions call for this kind of activity, it's, it's something that cannot be avoided. But what's the best way of doing it, Ivy? I mean, uh, are there... Uh, is it best to do this from within an organization on a one-to-one -one relationship basis? Is it best to all join platforms, the, the kind of platforms that Grow Asia represents? Uh, how, how do you think is the, is the best way we can begin to address those really big picture thorny issues? Yeah, supply chain is actually a, a great opportunity for us to, you know, to really to explore and 
uh, within Mitsuho, we have already started this kind of exercise. We explore several approach which uh, we can, uh, you know, provide uh, our, you know, uh, our client with supply chain finance. But that uh, also needs uh, the collaboration with external parties, such as uh, we've been uh, working with uh, uh, like a rating agency uh, that is specifically working on the supply chain ESG rating, you know, uh, to uh, give us more color on uh, all the uh, different parties along the supply chain, how they are performing uh, from a ESG lens so that uh, uh, as, as a bank, we can, you know, uh, save some resources on doing the due diligence uh, one by one on our own. So uh, this is one of the approach, and, but there are, you know, others that we are constantly looking at and trying to uh, do some pilot deals with our clients. So, um, and also I think the, uh, the emergence of sustainable finance, especially this, when we are talking about sustainable uh, bonds, uh, the sustainability bonds, green bonds, social bonds, uh, it actually offer another avenue for, uh, for, although not directly, but indirectly, it also, you know, uh, 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 do provide some funding for the, uh, the small holders. Say, for example, we've, uh, we've seen a couple of, uh, issuance of uh, sustainability bonds by, uh, food companies, uh, which, uh, specifically, uh, you know, uh, mentioned that their target population is smallholder farmer and they will, uh, invest in projects that help their, uh, from procurement, you know, sustainable procurement of their, uh, uh agriculture products to uh, better supporting um, the uh, smallholder with some financial service, you know, these kind of projects. And um, because, you know, right now we are, we are talking about uh, having a group of ESG investor, you know, constantly looking at this type of uh, investment opportunity. So uh, it actually create a momentum uh, for the company to really to, uh, you know, take it seriously to see what sort of projects they can, uh, you know, to uh, they can uh, roll out to create some social impact at the same time, attract this, this type of impact investors. So um, and um, it's not just about food company. We are also seeing, uh, say, for example, one of the leading telecom companies, they issue a sustainability bond, uh, one of the project uh, target that as a small holder farmer was about digitalizing the agri system ecosystem from providing access to uh, you know uh, some of the agriculture input to providing financial services such as insurance and then uh, also uh, talking about knowledge sharing uh, platform for smallholder farmers so you can see that uh, actually uh, different um, com you know different types of companies they are now exploring you know the opportunities on the social front. So uh, I think this could be something that uh, we can, you know, uh, as a bank to push ahead uh, more going forward. Let's let's talk, uh, come down from the, the big picture, the project level, the bond level, large scale financing conversations to, to the really much more granular nitty gritty. And you've both mentioned farmers a couple of times now. From the perspective of, of the financial industry, you have lending criteria that are not really appropriate to the situations of smallholder farmers. They, they may not have access to credit. They may have circumstances which mean that their reliability is often compromised. So, Deborah, to what extent is it necessary to begin to change the mindset of the lenders uh, as much as the mindset of the borrowers into something that can be replicable and can help them rise up and be uh, rise up out of poverty on a longer term basis? Yeah, I mean, the entire sector needs innovation and it needs intermediation in, in a way where there's creativity and entrepreneurship. So I think what um, what Mizuho and, and other large financial institutions are looking to do and where, where we've had the most success is where we identify those intermediaries that are actually going to help to bridge that gap, whether it's through technology, whether it's through AI, whether it's, whether it's through digitalization, it has to be a new way of approaching that subject because if we just stick with the large banks doing traditional financing and the small holders unbanked, we're not actually solving the problem. So it's it's around finding the intermediaries and non-banking financial institutions who are coming up with new solutions. And there are some really exciting things that have come up actually again during COVID because you know one of the, the positives of COVID has been that that there is a need to operate 
sort of offline or without human interaction. So that digitalization, that monitoring of, of agricultural progress, that actually matching of um, the farmer with the buyer in a remote setting um, ha has been something that, that's actually evolved quite a bit. And, and I think the, the investment to that sector, agritech, has actually more than doubled during the last two and a half years. So, so we see it as a really exciting way for us to, to co-invest directly in, in some of those intermediaries. And I mentioned a couple in terms of you know, the, the um, Vietnamese wallet platform and, and the Philippines Digital Bank, uh, but also to keep finding clients that, that we uh, as a large financial institution and, and, and the larger corporate side can provide financing to that are gonna help to solve this this lack of um, technology to monitor and assess credit at the smallholder level. So, so you know, we, we've uh, we've actually been pleasantly surprised at the creativity that's coming out of our own client base in in, in terms of finding solutions to help this this gap. So, uh, you know, we mentioned earlier on about um, you know how we're trying to move away from this model where everyone just left the responsibility for this kind of sustainable development of the smaller sector to governments and NGOs and try and get the private sector more involved. But having said that, Ivy, let's go back to government and say they still have an enormous role to play. Tell us a little bit about um, how you think the government should be engaged within ASEAN and beyond in this, in this development process and, and how you can engage with government sectors and what you want from government to help progress this uh, agenda. Yeah, I think government uh, also plays a very pivotal role in growing the sustainable finance market. Um, I think first and foremost is uh, uh, setting up a policy, uh, you know, uh, uh, like a fertile ground, uh, you know, giving more clear uh, guidance on, you know, um, uh, the sort, uh, the set of uh, uh, standard and regulation that uh, the players need to align with. Um, and also actively um, getting all the uh, different stakeholders together in a in a uh, more collaborative manner, and then work out some of the solution. Deborah, let, let me finish off by asking you: you know, what advice do you think you can give to people like Grow Asia, uh, to the B20 that will be meeting in Indonesia later on this year, and the, and the G20, when it comes to putting in place, um, whether it be policies or just practices, that can help us to accelerate this agenda of unlocking finance for small farmers? What would make it easier for you to be able to fulfill those criteria more easily? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think in incentives um, along the, the value chain, both for large corporates right down to the, the, the small and medium-sized businesses, to continue to not only uh, raise financing in a format that that actually um, is supportive to to small holders and social uh, elements, but also um, to to connect better. Because actually, um, if there's a way to to get aggregate some of these ideas, aggregate some of, some of these voices of the smaller holders. There's a more clear set of um, needs that that can be articulated, and then potentially the problems that that, that set has can can be better who's solved. Be, who's best so, to so be the aggregator? Hopefully. Should there be a, a central yes. node, a, a collective a central point, or is this is this a, a diversified in, environment? I think you know usually the aggregation or the responsibility of organizing the aggregation does does fall on the larger the larger players whether whether that's the financial institutions the larger size corporates or the governments and and uh, but in that aggregation that that those organizers don't forget to include the voice of of the further down the supply chain and, and not just stay at, at the very top level and also to continue to inv think about transition. Um, not just pure green, but how do, how do we get there? And like, what are the, the actual practical steps? Because quite a lot of the government efforts have been very much focused on, on things that are very neatly 100% uh, sustainable, but there's obviously a, a journey to get there and, and, and increasingly closer deadlines. But with that pressure also developing a, a, a way to get there that, that's going to allow 
practical um, solutions that are immediately implementable and and inclusive of the entire well, supply chain. Well, I'm glad you said that the responsibility should fall on some of the big companies because we did begin this conversation on that very premise of how can we get those big companies to come in and play more of a role because there's so much talent, there's so much knowledge, there's so much experience within those companies uh, that really should be engaging more with the governments and the nonprofits to make this happen. And I'm glad to hear that Mizuho is, is thinking of, of playing a, an outsized role in that activity. It's been a pleasure talking to both of you and I appreciate your joining me on this conversation. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.